Welcome to Talking Feds, a roundtable that brings together prominent figures from government law and journalism for a dynamic discussion of the most important topics of the day. I'm Harry Littman. There was strange late summer weather in the country this week, and much of it seemed to be swirling around former President Donald Trump. A Trump-appointed judge threw the former president a life preserver with an order for a special master to review for both attorney-client and executive privileges the documents seized in the Mar-a-Lago search. The order was tendentious, muddled, and naive, and it was lambasted from all sides. By week's end, DOJ had requested a partial stay, serving notice that if the court didn't grant it, it would appeal to the 11th Circuit. The continuing focus on the divisive figure of the former president, combined with a series of legislative achievements by the Biden administration and the still growing outrage over the Supreme Court decision overruling Roe v. Wade, put wind in the sails of the Democrats with the midterm elections fast approaching. Finally, the death of Queen Elizabeth gave rise to reflections on the course of history over the last century and the singular institution of the British monarchy. To help us analyze these complicated political and legal maelstroms, we are pleased to welcome three of the country's most prominent and incisive commentators, and they are Emily Bazelon, a staff writer at the New York Times Magazine, co-host of the popular and excellent podcast, The Slate Political Gab Fest, and a lecturer and Truman Capote fellow at Yale Law School. Her newest book is Charged, the New Movement to Transform American Prosecution and End Mass Incarceration. Emily Bazelon, thanks for being here. Thanks for having me. Natasha Bertrand, White House reporter with CNN, covering national security, among other topics, She's written for Business Insider, The Atlantic, NBC News, and Politico, where she covered the impeachment inquiry against Trump, everyone remember that, and broke scoop after scoop. In 2021, Natasha was named to the Forbes 30 Under 30 list in media. Thank you so much for returning. Always a pleasure to welcome you, Natasha. Thanks for having me. And Bill Crystal the editor-at-large at The Bulwark and founder and director of Defending Democracy Together, an organization dedicated to defending America's liberal democratic norms, principles, and institutions. He founded The Weekly Standard in 1995 and edited that influential magazine for over two decades, and he served in senior positions in the Reagan and George H.W. Bush administrations. He's also the host of the highly regarded video series and podcast, Conversations with Bill Crystal. Bill Crystal, thanks very much for being here. Thanks, Harry. Good to be with you. All right. So the week began with a decision from a judge in Palm Beach granting the former president's request for a special master to go over the documents seized in the search on August 8th. It was lambasted, I think it's fair to say, from all corners, including this corner, for its tendentious factual account and shoddy legal reasoning. Now the DOJ has filed a motion in that court for a partial stay to permit the use of certain documents, the classified documents, for criminal investigative purposes. Let's just start with the decision itself. It seemed pretty threadbare for someone of her credentials. Anybody read the opinion and have thoughts about it? My reaction is this, uh, that before that opinion got handed down, I was on a, one of these you know, thread, email threads with a lot of very distinguished lawyers, very experienced, very sensible, impressive. I learned a ton from this and don't participate much because I'm not a lawyer. And it's very interesting to hear these people. And there was a lot of, boy, the DOJ had a very good brief. I mean, there's no chances that she can go the other way. And, and she went to a good law school and clerked for someone. And, you know, they even these Trumpy judges or the conservative judges on the bench now are problematic. I mean, who's ever heard of a special master in this case? And executive privilege is just out of the question. And there's only one executive. Don't the conservatives believe in the unitary executive? In any way, whatever tiny attorney-client issues there are, they're totally different from the executive privilege, blah, 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 blah. And I, the only thing I said was, I'm sure you're all right, but you know what? <laughs> We're kind of in a new world here. And I do think it's a little bit still, six years in, too much complacency among sort of every group, so to speak, that its own institutions, they're fine. 
uh, to be fair, the lawyers, the courts have held up better than almost any chunk of American political and institutional life. You know, they certainly held up well in November, December 2020. And so there's a certain kind of reliance, as, as you lawyers like to say, on that, more suitable for the courts than certainly for Congress, let's say, which would be the other end of the spectrum where the Republican Party and the media is probably in between and so forth. But I think people are still a little too complacent that, well, if every intelligent former assistant U.S. attorney and former federal judge in the country thinks this is the obvious outcome, it's going to be the outcome. The most surprising thing in speaking to our sources about this to them was the fact that this halted really the criminal investigation. And that has had ramifications on the intelligence community's review of these documents that were taken from Mar-a-Lago. Because as Bill said, the unitary executive theory, right? The intelligence community now is like, well, we can't continue our review of these documents to see what kind of damage has been done by Trump having them at Mar-a-Lago. If the FBI and the Justice Department isn't allowed to simultaneously review the documents. It just really doesn't work. And so they actually notified, the the DOJ notified the court yesterday in its appeal that the intelligence community has halted its review. And so this is having real impacts on the intelligence community and the potential impact on sources and methods. We, We don't even really know what they are yet. Right. I mean, in terms of protecting the security of the country, that is absolutely the most important (laughs) ramification. I think, Harry, your analysis throughout has been really strong about the legal weaknesses of this opinion. She kind of garbled executive privilege and attorney-client privilege. She didn't seem, as Natasha is saying, to understand the implications for the intelligence investigation if she was going to halt the criminal investigation. And I think the most important thing is that she acts as if the president is above the law. There's this like hyper kind of solicitousness. Is that a word? Hyper solicitude? Totally. For a former president. I looked it up on Google. It's definitely... (laughs) And there's maybe some interesting conversation to be had about whether a former president ever retains executive privilege over materials covered by the Presidential Records Act that clearly belong to the United States, not to him or her. But this scenario But not is, these, right. Yeah. Exactly. It's so far away from that. And she has really shifted the whole framing, or at least tried to, away from the damage of these unsecured documents floating around Mar-a-Lago to this concern about former President Trump and his reputation and this idea of like some stigma attaching to him. And it just seems very divorced from the facts. And it seems like the Trump team went judge shopping and they fished their wish. So, Bill, I feel properly chastened because I was one of the guys on that. You kindly didn't out me on it, but I I was one of the, you know, fuddy-duddy lawyers who thought she was going to go away and write it, and I just felt it can't write. The executive privilege part just can't write. And you know what? It can't write. And it's a really good point that the courts have done so much better than many institutions, but many institutions have been abysmal, and they're kind of at what? Maybe 75%, which is hallelujah, but of course, one of the remaining 25% can be the U.S. Supreme Court. So at any given time, there's a chance for a pincer movement that really, it's not just getting it wrong, but getting it wrong in this way that reinforces Trumpism and the disregard of the rule of law and is the kind of deeper thing we worry about. On Natasha's point, I don't know how she whiffed on that. It's so true. And it's so elementary. You have the attorney general and deputy attorney general who supervise both. They said, we have canceled the counterintelligence review. And basically, in polite terms, you're kind of a public enemy here. So they have come forward very, I think, cleverly said, just get rid, please, of the stay insofar as it concerns the classified documents But we're at kind of the crystal principle again. It seems like, oh, God, she's got to go for the life preserver here. I mean, she's been lambasted, but maybe not. Maybe she quadruples down. I mean, they're not going to agree with the DOJ. (laughs) Why would they do that? (laughs) I mean, a footnote to to Natasha's I mean, when she wrote that, and you all correctly said this is ridiculous, and I wasn't really at all uh, owning you or anyone else, obviously. I mean, it was very, in fact, it was very good commentary on it. This is a big advantage, I'd say, of social media and the internet. You get very intelligent commentary very fast and see, well, this is wrong, and this is wrong, and what about this? But the thing that struck me, having been in the executive branch at a marginally really senior level, but seeing some of these documents and so forth being cleared for everything, 
I mean, the whole idea that you could pursue the quote counterintelligence investigation without the criminal one and therefore and shut down FBI and DOJ. But she sort of sold this that you'd read media articles the next day or two is, well, the counterintelligence, they're going to go over the documents. They, you know what? They've gone over the documents. That's not what a counterintelligence investigation is. A counterintelligence investigation is who saw these documents? With whom did Donald Trump discuss them? Did I'm making this up now, obviously. Did a Saudi delegation go to Mar-a-Lago on November 14th, 2021? Did Trump meet with them? Who else knew about the meeting? What happened after? I mean, that you need to interrogate a ton of people if you're talking about super classified documents being not a classified environment. And so that's why you have to have the criminal investigation in a sense as part of the counterintelligence. The CIA cannot go interrogate people. The CIA cannot send CIA agents to Mar-a-Lago to say yeah. who visited Mar-a-Lago let me see the logs. That's by law, if I'm not mistaken, Harry, isn't that right? It has to be the FBI. Yeah. The CIA can't do it domestic. So people were somewhat too credulous and that, well, the CIA can do its work because they can go like look at these documents with a microscope or something. I don't know. Anyway, just to buy a little venting on the, but yeah. this is where the effect of Trump and Trumpism and all the distortions of it are so far reaching or, or so... Then more than we think of the direct ones. You know what I mean? A lot yeah. of the understanding of how government works gets distorted. A lot of things can go wrong as a result of such a decision. Yeah, I mean, in a word, hyper solicitous, I think. She's a former assistant U.S. attorney, but I think also she has like very few to none of things like symposiums and conferences and other things on her resume that might give you some sense that she had some reputation that people were interested in hearing from her. And I don't know how she's going to avoid doubling down because federal judges don't usually say like, oh, just kidding, I got it wrong five minutes later, even when it's really clear. The problem, of course, is that then if the Justice Department is forced to go to the 11th Circuit, it's going to take a really long time. Even if you want to have faith in the 11th Circuit, because there are 11 of them. So even if there are six Republican appointees, you could still think that like common sense and rule of law might prevail. It will just take a really long time. And that is not good for the government's investigation. Would that take a long time? Couldn't they get a stay very quickly, maybe? It could get a stay. My best guess is the stay that they've asked for now They'll rehearse in the 11th Circuit and just get it. And as for cocked as the whole opinion is, if they get that stay, there'll be some useless gyrations with the other parts of things. But the real damage, the executive privilege stuff and the harm to national security, I think will go away. But they've been very strategic here, including in their request for relief. It can sound like just a uh, hundred little classified documents and kind of surgical. And I think they're trying to let her save face by just allowing it and, and you know, not bludgeoning her with having to completely back off. And then what happens to the special master? I think the special master goes forward with this useless inquiry where he or she goes over not just not just the 500 or so attorney client privilege pages which you know as we've said till we're blue in the face people don't do that for this small number it's a very straightforward thing for the magistrate judge to do and I think she's saying they'll go ahead with the non-classified public documents the uh, 10,000 plus and That'll be a nice payday for a special master, but it really won't hurt the investigation, which they still have stuff to do. And the real risk to me was always that he or she would have to call balls and strikes on executive privilege in a way that that would be the real delay. He would make a call. Trump would challenge. It would go to her and, you know, all the way up. This may actually extinguish that issue and it ceases to be a delay, but sort of a parallel track. What about their um, noble adversary, the former president of the United States? So it doesn't seem like there's room to double down anymore. But sure enough, he's been republishing the nastiest QAnon stuff. And then you could say he kind of took the bait from Biden in Philadelphia. But I mean, he is really calling out the FBI and the whole thing as if we're in a complete police state. His rhetoric seemed over even his top. Do you agree? And then is this putting the Republicans in an even worse spot than he had them in a couple months ago? The deja vu I've been getting from just covering him while he was in the White House and dealing with the Russian investigation is just 
unbelievable. But I think one of the really interesting case studies of this, to your latter point about how Republicans are, are reacting to this, is Marco Rubio, who chairs the Senate Intelligence Committee. He's walking a very, very delicate line right now, obviously, because on the one hand, he doesn't want to completely alienate Trump. On the other hand, I think he does recognize that this is a serious national security issue. So his, I think how he handles this will be interesting to watch. And apparently the Senate Intelligence Committee is going to get some kind of a look at some of these documents that were taken next week, although I don't really know how the whole situation with the court is going to influence that because the Senate Intelligence Community was hoping to get some kind of a briefing from the IC, but whether or not now that's on hold, I think is another question. I'll just mention that the Gang of Eight, he's far from the most irresponsible member of it. it. You know, they have to know that two or three of them will put out press releases right away. Yeah, I mean, that's the thing. Briefing Congress is always the last thing that they want to do, right? Yeah. But they've asked many times and they're hoping that they can get something. But the hilarious thing about this, I think, has been Trump's arguments about how these are on the one hand, documents that he declassified. On the other hand, they're documents that the FBI planted. But I think that the whole declassification issue is going to also play really, really big into this. And depending on what kind of documents they find, for example, if they are those documents about Russia that he claims many times to have declassified, will he say that he's been vindicated? I mean, there are just so many different elements of this that for the Justice Department, they're also kind of walking a very weird political tightrope here. And he's a great example, of course, because he's in a Senate race that he might have won comfortably. And now it looks like he's one of those who are threatened. I just want to make one quick lawyerly point about the declassified argument. And it's the counterpoint to what you're saying, Bill, because actually it's not just the courts often get it right, but it has this sort of interim effect. You know, remember when Sidney Powell got up and in her defamation suit, her defense was nobody could reasonably believe what I was saying. Well, Trump's been saying this and push will come to shove Monday morning, just just as we're being published, will he attempt to actually say in court, they haven't yet, that he declassified things? Because that's the thing about court. There are real consequences for lying. Is he going to push his lawyers up there to possibly get really serious professional sanctions? My best guess is they will back away from this kind of argument because even she could crucify him. Bill, you are very concerned, not just the adversary gamesmanship, but I mean, we're talking about possibly really grievous harm that's already occurred to the national security. You've tweeted about that a couple of times. Give us your thoughts, especially as an executive branch alum. Well, just I think if there are the kinds of nuclear documents about other countries' nuclear programs, let's just right. call it that, that's usually what they're implying, how far along they are, presumably undeclared ones, presumably covert, presumably countries that may not have be declared nuclear powers, that's very sensitive stuff. And maybe he takes it just because he's a pack rat and he it fuels his vanity to have them and he shows them to some, then he suddenly say that third sentence, he shows them to someone and what are we talking about here? We're actually showing people I'm making this up again, stipulating right, nothing. Right, I haven't seen a classified document in 25 years. But I mean, you know, the he's showing them to a guest, and it turns out that sources and methods of how we know about the Saudi or UAE or Israeli or God knows what other programs it suddenly becomes evident to someone who's just a guest. And I mean, the whole thing is such an unbelievable breach of the normal care, maybe excessive care, honestly, with which some of these documents, not these, but other documents are, are taken in terms of the classification. That again, I thought there wasn't enough alarm. But again, you know, probably he didn't show them to anyone. Probably they sat in a folder. Probably it was just slightly random, maybe, or Trump had some thought of using them at some point and never has. But one doesn't know for sure. You know, in the legal system, push does come to shove and in courts and you pay a price for lying, one hopes, and you're guilty if you're guilty and you're innocent if you're innocent. What is so amazing, and as Sasha said, you feel like you've seen this movie before, and it's true, but it gets worse and worse, and push never comes to shove. You know, how many Republican senators or members of Congress, many of whom are senior people on relevant committees like intelligence, armed services, some of whom served in the FBI, how many have said, wait a second, I like Trump, I don't regret voting for him, I like the policies, but this is a bridge too far. You cannot trash the FBI. Zero. Zero. Now, yes, Marco Rubio, they're being a little careful, they're treading the line, they're, they're trying to duck, they're not taking questions. But that's a long way from saying, I'm sorry, this is wrong. And if no one says it's wrong, what are voters out there who are at all inclined to be on, let's call it the Republican side or Trump side or suspicious of the left for good and bad reasons? What message do they take? They take the message that, I don't know, maybe it's 
It's just the liberal media and the Democrats who were upset and Biden's Justice Department because I haven't seen a single person except for Liz Cheney saying anything. I mean, it, there's a reason why it was so important for Nancy Pelosi to her credit to make Liz Cheney central to the committee and for Liz Cheney to make all those Republican witnesses central to the committee. Bill Barr has been the most important person actually in the last two or three days, much as I sort of hate to give yeah. him credit in saying this is nuts, you know? So maybe that's, that's done some good. But Bill Barr is now more critical of Trump than 98% of the Republican elected officials in this country. You know, one thing I find so frustrating about this dynamic is that Trump is a classic bully, right? And the only way you defeat a bully is when there's a united front and everybody either turns their back or tells the bully they're wrong. And instead, what keeps happening is one by one, some bolder Republican comes forward and kind of walks the plank. So you have Liz Cheney, now you have Bill Barr, and like Trump can try to discredit them each individually, and they get called rhinos and kind of isolated. I mean, Bill, this has happened to you yourself, right? And then it continues on. There isn't a moment where the leadership of the Senate and the House on the Republican side come out together. There isn't a moment where the party has some kind of mass act of collective action. And without that, you're just going to keep having Trump try to pick people off. I want to sound just one counterpoint to your sanguinity, your hyper solicitous sanguinity about, oh, well, he probably didn't do anything with it. Two quick points. First, we have an overlay now based on the fact that he bobs and weaves for a year, then another four months, then subpoena, resisting and only the search, which is what are the ones that wind up still there August 8th? It could have been just, you know, random, but you have to think it's the ones he kind of liked the best for whatever reason. And that reason seems, it being Trump, likely transactional. And just the the whiff of that is terrifying. And then the second thing is, I wouldn't even know the name of the special top secret clearance you have to get to be one of the 12 people who can see it. But I do know there are some very, very clever, sophisticated ways that our adversaries are employing all the time to get at stuff, including, I think, my understanding is the reason you can't take a phone into a skiff is they can be halfway around the world and can hear everything you hear and photo if they're good. And of course they're good. We saw this in, you know, 2016 with Russia. And we probably wouldn't know, I guess, is the sort of third point. So this could really, honestly, already have exacted a very bad cost. Okay, it's time for our sidebar feature where we explain an important concept in the law and the news. Today, we're going to talk about hearsay, which is an important rule of evidence that restricts the kinds of conversations that a jury can hear. And to explain it for us, I'm really pleased to welcome George Newbern, a film, television, and voice actor who is best known for his roles as Charlie in Scandal, Brian McKenzie in the Father of the Bride series, and the voice of Superman in many pieces of DC Comics media. So I give you George Newbern on Hearsay. What is Hearsay? Supporters of former President Trump attempted to mitigate the damaging testimony by Cassidy Hutchinson, top paid to Trump's chief of staff, by claiming her testimony was Hearsay. But what is Hearsay? Hearsay is an out-of-court statement introduced in court for the purpose of establishing the truth of whatever the statement asserts. For example, imagine Ms. Hutchinson took the stand in court and testified that she heard a Secret Service agent tell Trump that the crowd had weapons. If the statement were being used to prove that the crowd did in fact have weapons, in effect, to establish the truth of the matter, it would be hearsay and would not be admissible. However, statements are not hearsay if they are being used to prove something other than the truth of the statement. For example, Ms. Hutchinson's testimony about the Secret Service agent saying the crowd had weapons is hearsay if used to establish that the crowd had weapons, but not to prove that Trump believed that the crowd had weapons. The law regards hearsay with suspicion because statements in court are made under oath and subject to cross-examination, so the jury can evaluate if the witness is lying. 
But it's difficult for a jury to judge the credibility of a speaker that isn't in front of them. The hearsay rule is designed to limit the use of this less reliable evidence. The hearsay rule has many exemptions and exceptions. First, certain categories of -of out-of-court statements are not considered hearsay even though they otherwise fit the definition. So, for example, a statement by a party opponent or his co-conspirators is not hearsay. That means, for example, that in a prosecution of Trump, nothing Trump said would be hearsay. In addition, many exceptions allow categories of what the rule drafters considered reliable hearsay to be used in court. For example, the federal rules allow for the admission of excited utterances, statements about an unexpected event made while under the stress of the event. The justification for allowing these statements is that when people are making excited utterances, they are unlikely to be lying about them. For Talking Feds, I'm George Newbern. Thanks very much, George Newbern, for that explanation. All right, it is now time for a spirited debate brought to you by our sponsor, Total Wine and More. Each episode, you'll be hearing an expert talk about the pros and cons of a particular issue in the world of wine, spirit, and beverages. Thanks, Harry. In today's spirited debate, we break out the three types of vodka to see if there's a clear difference. Vodka is typically a colorless, flavorless spirit, served neat and freezer chilled. Simple, right? But long before the shot glasses are topped off and toasts are shouted, there's a fermenting process. For vodka, that process involves distilling an organic base like barley, rye, wheat, even potatoes or corn to make one of three types of vodka plain, flavored, and infused. Rye can add a heavier texture and spice. Barley may be a little lighter and mild, while potatoes can add a creamy mouthfeel. Unflavored is the simplest and most traditional form of vodka with a mixture of 40% ethanol and 60% water. Flavored vodka has recently become extremely popular, adding flavors that range from fruit to dessert-inspired options like chocolate, A charcoal-filtered vodka provides a smoother taste, perfect for creating a chocolate martini that tastes as great as it sounds. Lastly, there's infused vodka, also known as botanical vodka, where the distillers infuse the vodka by adding ingredients like herbs, flowers, spices, and fruit, which are steamed into the spirit during the distillation process. It's an excellent choice to dial your drink in any flavor direction you want. The best part of them all is that you don't have to travel the world to find the greatest vodkas. Your local Total Wine & More has a large selection of every type and flavor, so all you have to do is clear out a little extra room in your freezer. So find what you love and love what you find, only at Total Wine & More. Cheers! Thanks to our friends at Total Wine & More for today's A Spirited Debate. So let's get a little bit more into the nitty-gritty of what's Coming up in just a couple months, I guess we can say we're in the season of it, the midterms. Here's my question. So, you know, a couple months ago, uh, God, it's a midterm. It's going to be a referendum on the incumbent. And Biden, for whatever reason, isn't very popular and really looking ahead to what happens if the Republicans take over. My question is, have we gone too far in the other direction? Because definitely... The thrust of the articles out there now, here, I'll just quote the one from the Hill. The big red wave has crested and turned into a rising blue tide. Is there really a rising blue tide or, you know, is that sort of just a journalistic conceit? Well, I mean, yes, the data is pretty startling. I myself was always... I will say it was one of of the few things I've gotten right here in recent years. I was very (laughs) skeptical about the determinism of the red wave. I mean, history would suggest it. And the fact that polarization is intensified and therefore demography is destiny and red states divert, revert at the end. All that was people who've been betting on the kind of red wave scenario have been right the last two or three elections. And people like me were saying, well, wait, there's a good candidate here in North Dakota, a Democrat. And it was like, forget it. North Dakota's Republican. It doesn't matter if Heidi <laughs> Camp is you know, a wonderful person. And so the demography is destiny and history is destiny. People were right and increasingly right over the last 20 years. That's what polarization means when you think about it for a minute. But it also is true that these waves, if I can use that term, crest, these trends, crest, 
A and B, uh, and we, we do have two things going on in this year that we didn't, we don't normally have. Trump, an ex-president who tried to overturn the election on January 6th, the leader of one of the two parties, it sort of changes the dynamic of, let's have a referendum on the incumbent party because we're grumpy about gas prices. It's just a little different. Maybe it's not different for 95% of the voters, but it could be different for 5% or 3%. And then when Roe came down, I think I was one of those who thought it really Dodd. would be a big yeah. deal. And it has been a big deal. And there's just now a ton of data on that. Could the blue undertow be cresting after the red wave crested and will go back down to a sort of somewhere in between? Absolutely possible. I, I'm totally agnostic on whether the blue undertow continues to rise, if undertows can rise or whatever. It, it yields. I think that's all possible. But I, there's no denying that we're in a very different position and than we were two or three months ago. And in an unusually different position in the sense that the momentum has been for the incumbent party. It's usually the other way, A and B. I don't quite see going forward why the blue counterwave should subside. That is, Roe's not going away. These issues of state legislatures trying to grapple with what their laws should be. It's just still the fact that if you're voting in Michigan or Wisconsin, who the next governor is really does matter to what the abortion law is. I mean, so I don't think that fact Pennsylvania. changes. Now, if there's like a huge economic crisis, of course, that fact can be less important than other facts or if gas prices go shooting back up or something. But the fundamental facts for me, which are Trump and Roe, which at this point are threatened to Trump, the gas prices, normal dissatisfaction with incumbent, which are the fundamental facts on the other side, I think those facts are as likely to stay there and conceivably even more noticeable than is to go away. So I'm sort of a believer in the blue undertow, if that's the right term, but doesn't mean it's inevitably continues or it doesn't end up somewhere in between. Now, Emily mentioned Pennsylvania. I mean, President Biden visited there like three times in one week. It just shows how unbelievably crucial he believes that state is. And I'm sure you've talked about this in previous episodes as well, but the fact that Mitch McConnell said, what, three weeks ago, that he believes that <laughs> the candidate quality in Senate races actually matters, therefore he finds it unlikely that the Republicans are going to take back the Senate, <laughs> I thought was pretty revealing as well. But of course, even that was such a wonderful case of the way now everyone in the Republican side feels they have to talk. Why do they have candidates of that quality? Is that just a mysterious, flukish thing that happened because voters went crazy in a bunch of different states? I think there's one human being who's mostly responsible for that fact, whose name McConnell can't mention. I mean, it's so true. Who, who are the real poster children for the are you kidding me, school candidates? You know, for Herschel Walker and Mastriano and Dr. Oz. All the Arizona, all the Arizona right, candidates. And even lower ballot. Yeah, I mean, I think Bill and Natasha are making the key points that Trump and Dobbs have made this a referendum on the Republican Party and the Republican agenda in a way that's really unusual in a midterm election, right? It's like harder to have it all be about throwing the bums out when the out party is actually like very front and center and getting a huge thing done, i.e. ending abortion in many states. At the same time, one thing that I feel unresolved about, and I wonder what your thoughts on this are, but usually you see the polls tighten in the last 10 days before a midterm election. So when you look at the Senate numbers, you could still end up with the Democrats in control or maybe barely in control of the Senate. But when I look at the House polls, given polarization and gerrymandering and how people have sorted and where they live in America, it still seems like the House switching over to Republican control seems fairly likely. Bill, you sort of handicapped it at three to one or one out of four, the House changing, although said, you know, it's worth fighting. So why do you see it as still fundamentally uphill? And what concretely, if the party agrees it's worth the fight, does that mean they do that they wouldn't otherwise if they were throwing in the towel? I think 538 had it at one in Four. I mean, I, I just think that's kind of an analysis of the polls and a, an attempt to project from the polls to the you know final distribution, yeah. given the slight bias that the Republicans have because of redistricting and a couple other things. The point I sort of wanted to make, and I will make actually here, is is that donors and and sort of, but I'd say this is true of political observers and commentators too, are very like they should go to horse races more or something. One in four things come in sometimes. In fact, I believe, and I'm not a math expert here, I believe if there are three or yeah. four one in four possibilities, <laughs> one of them is likely to come in. So people say, well, Rubio yeah. can't win. And then I Rubio look at one, well, that's one in six. If you just, again, this is totally mechanical. I mean, I, Nate Silver just trying mm -hmm. to do the, the 
historical distribution of outcomes if you've what, got what this an american in the power place. base he's become you know? what you know but everyone's become right. like extremely right. deterministic to use a term i used right. earlier and it's sort of like i don't know is it out of the question that val demings wins or that mcmullen wins i mean one of those could come in and i do think the democrats have more races that could come in with a little movement now this way that could really make a difference i think one in four is a high number if you had said three months ago the democrats have a word then it was people would talk about it like it was one in 20. I mean, what he said, but we are so statistically enumerate, I think is the term that's been coined, but it's just true. But this is what he said in 2016. Guys, I said about three to one, four to one. That happens. And it happened. Now, Trump won. I never said it was 20 to one. Bone up on your elementary statistics. Yeah, that seems right. I always need to be reminded as someone who's not super numerate <laughs> that like one in four, 25% chance, would you bet your life on it? Like, yeah. no, you wouldn't. The second half of my question, though, is so if you take that view, does that mean even at the on the House side, a kind of strategic investment in a dozen races? So what it means to me is two things. In the House side, you, you invest in some possible pickups, not just in playing defense for Abigail Spanberger and Lurie and Slotkin and all these people who I all like and respect. And that's the fundamental first thing they have to do is defend their incumbents in tough districts. And four or five pickups can go a long way to you know, that gives you much more margin to lose a couple of seats and still hold the majority. And I don't think that's, I've looked district by district and I tried to a little bit, not gone to those places, but just look at the numbers, you know, and there's some possible pickups here, a couple of bad candidates, one or two redistricting things, lucky in one or two places. And suddenly, I'll give you an example, we're talking about Roe and this is, so there were like four Republican pickup seats from 2020 in California. And they sort of have actually attractive younger candidates and so forth. It gets to redistricting. Some of these seats got a little better, a little worse. They were all vaguely seem to have said they are for a federal law banning abortion, except in very, very limited circumstances, federal legislation. So it is relevant to your House vote. It's not just like a symbolic. And I don't know, are they going to pay some price for that politically in California? It's possible. They'll lose three seats. Suddenly, this 12-seat Democratic pickup, if you lose three seats, isn't that become not just a nine-seat, but a six-seat Democratic pickup, right? Because they're flips. Uh, I don't know. I just feel like people are still too not attentive enough to sort of the, the upset possibilities against some of those Republican incumbents, the weaker ones who just won in 2020. And on the Democratic side, the implication for me is that you do bet on Val Demings. The marginal $5 million, if you're a massive Democratic super PAC, for Fetterman in Pennsylvania at this point is not as good an investment as spending that $5 million for Demings in Florida, maybe in, for Beasley in North Carolina, or for a couple of other sort of uphill races that aren't out of the question for the Democrats. So I think it does lead you to a slightly more aggressive posture. And final point, the fact that they've had this blue movement during the summer has finally gotten Democratic donors excited. Yeah, and Republican donors, the opposite, right? The professionals I talked to four months ago, the Republicans were all revved up. We're going to win. we got to invest. we also got to invest because they're going to win. They're going to be speaker. We need to be on good terms. So here's an extra million dollars for Kevin McCarthy's pack. Suddenly, it's like the Democrats who were exhausted after 2020 and a little demoralized that things hadn't gotten too much better by 2022 and Biden administration and saving it up for the, whatever candidate they wanted to support in 23, 24, you know, suddenly it's like, whoa, we could actually hold a Senate, pick up a senator's seat or two, perceivably change some of the rules if you get 52 Democrats. So I think the money advantage, I think this is pretty widespread now, is, is with the Democrats, which means they can play at a wider field without dissipating resor- diluting resources, where suddenly it's the Republicans, we've seen some stories about this, who have to say, oof, in this race, we're going to pull back, right? So that is not what one expects in an off year like this. Usually the whole point of the wave momentum, the momentum's on your side, so you get more and more resources in September and October. And that's why a pretty good result becomes a very good result, because there's a certain dynamic built in, you might say, to the way these elections work. But the dynamic now is more on the Democratic side. And there is this wild card that everyone's adverted to, it's not obscure, the Dobbs decision, but many people, I think, Bill, you're among them, said people are, as much as we focus on, they are not focusing on it enough. And you read these stories here and there about basically people are not aware of how strong the reaction is. So it, I've certainly read pieces from people I respect saying this translates into a bigger political wave than people really understand so far. You've also mentioned quickly a few times redistricting. From the Democratic standpoint, it's pretty raw, the things that have happened and where they've happened. I think if redistricting had gone the way the Democrats wanted it to go in New York, in particular, and a couple of other states, then you would have seen a pretty even field in terms of 
gerrymandering giving the party an advantage in a particular state. But instead, you know, you had courts strike down Democratic gerrymanders. And so that unraveled the Democrats' plans to gain a bunch of seats in New York in particular. I feel like I'm forgetting another Democratic state in which there was a court. Ohio. There had been two or three bad ones. Ohio, the Republicans succeeded in imposing a gerrymander. And of course, North Carolina, the court did strike it down. The price we're going to pay for that, people should worry a little more about this coming Mm. forward, is the independent state legislature doctrine is now going to be flatly before the Supreme Court. I'm sure you'll devote many, many podcasts to this in the future, (laughs) Harry, but it's uh, interesting that it has come out of a gerrymandering case. Right. I'll do a little plug, actually, coming up in a few weeks. It's a hell of an event if you guys have been to the Texas Tribune Festival, and we'll be down there with a couple of things, but one of them will be the Supreme Court preview panel. And what would have been six months ago, complete doggerel to everybody, including lawyers, is going to be a household word, independent state legislature doctrine. All right. What will be the next kind of tangible guidepost that will say this prospect for the Dems is waning, or in fact, it's holding It's holding pretty fast. What are the sophisticated bellwethers to try to look to? I mean, I'll just say one thing, which is I mean, one of the th- reasons the blue counterwave was real, I'm th- confident it was real, is we actually had real elections, not just polls. We had special elections right, in four point. in a row yeah. for congressional seats where Democrats considerably outperformed not just expectations, but the actual vote in 2020 in that district. So you have apples to apples comparison. So, you know, it's pretty hard to deny that when it happens. For We don't, we won't have, I don't believe, any more special elections before November 8th. So we are now in a world of polling and, and atmospherics and impressions. And there could be misleading bad polls as there were in 2020 and Republicans will outperform. And that would be the strongest argument for me for the Republicans is, A, these waves subside. The summer is not a good guide to the fall. History reasserts itself, democracy reasserts itself, and we have now a couple, one cycle at least of ex- 2016 and 2020 of experience of just the polls, Democrats being happier to talk to pollsters than Republicans, or for whatever reason, the polls overstating Democratic support a little. I am not sure that's the case at all. Maybe they've compensated for that. Who knows? But we are now a little more, unfortunately, flying blind than we have been for the last two months, where we had real special elections to deduce things from. I mean, shouldn't we also assume the polls are a bit off, perhaps the way they were in 2020? That's what I'm saying. So that's, I think, a problem. Everyone assumes that they understate Republican strength. I don't, Nate Silver would say, look, they can be off either way, right? Maybe there were, I'm making this up, there were women in deep red areas who, surrounded by Trump people in their church, and their husband's a Trump guy, and they don't feel comfortable saying that they're actually privately going to go and vote for a Democrat for governor in Western Michigan, because they privately do not want the state coming down on them in in terms of abortion, right? And that's conceivable. It's conceivable, though the real problem, I think, with the polling has been low trust voters, the people who don't pick up the phone to begin with, and they tend to skew Republican, right? Even if you're trying to control for education, race, these other factors that are salient, that seems like it's been a real problem for pollsters. And this doubles back to where we started, really, because you have this phenomenon of Trump out there, and not just Trump now, Marco Rubio basically trashing the FBI and the courts. In general, it feels to me that the purchase and persistence of Trumpism post-Trump is way more than I, for one, anticipated. Well, obviously, much more to come on that. You know, often at the very end of a show, we do a five words or fewer on a question of the day. It's a big event, however you slice it, the Queen's death. And I thought I would just open it up for brief discussions about thoughts there. Obviously, there have been plenty of encomia that we needn't add to. But I wonder if anything about the institution of the royalty or something about her personally or the end of of a long era, et cetera, if it just gives rise to any thoughts in any of our minds, now would be timely to surface. I have a fun fact that I keep hearing on CNN, which is that the first ever prime minister that she experienced as queen was born in 1874, Winston Churchill. Wow. And the last was born in 1975, which is Liz Truss. Isn't that crazy? Wow. Yeah. It's wild. Churchill really comes of it. It's before It's in the Boer Wars before the First World War. It's a different planet. Yeah, it's amazing. 
I love how that gets across how she spanned the generations, Natasha. Yeah. Um, I have a yeah. very specific, and I hope this isn't going to sound disrespectful, but I love how she died. She had a meeting that she canceled with the Privy Council. It was a video meeting, but she canceled. I mean, I read the story that was like, and she canceled a meeting tonight. And I was like, oh, her doctors are concerned. And then she died. And we live in a society of medicalized death in which it is really hard to have what seems like a kind of proper and speedy death, which I think a lot of us wish for in some way. And it seems like she somehow managed that. And I just think that's kind of amazing. Yeah, and Liz Truss, who was born in 1975, visited her on, was it Wednesday that she got tapped right. to be prime minister? So that's, and, and the queen is standing up, fully dressed as an appropriate garb, <laughs> so with her handbag, you know, the whole thing, right? It's <laughs> yeah. kind of amazing. Yeah. Your invocation, Natasha, of um, Winston Churchill puts me in mind of something. You know, the queen's a political figure, and yet other political figures stand for election. And a startling fact about Winston Churchill is he saves the world and saves England and they vote him out the next year and his sort of up and downs as a political figure. And there's something about the queen. Again, I don't want to be disrespectful, but in any kind of snapshot, she's sort of her queenly stable self. She doesn't sort of blow you away, but it's this incredible horizontal trajectory where year after year she maintains the same dignity fineness and i you know i don't mean that in a twee way but integrity stability and if they were voting on queen she'd have been voted in and out eight times right but instead she gets to be this figure and it's almost an overlay on the british society itself the way in which it is for all its normal political back and forth has this solid. There's always an England there. And I'll just say, I mean, I think she really was this little by little and by accretion, a figure of great sort of integrity and love, et cetera. And it may well be that that's the last hero (laughs) that the British royalty will have going forward. We are out of time. Thank you very much to Emily, Natasha, and Bill. And thank you very much, listeners, for tuning in to Talking Feds. If you like what you've heard, please tell a friend to subscribe to us on Apple Podcasts or wherever they get their podcasts. And please take a moment to rate and review this podcast. You can also now subscribe to us on our YouTube channel, where we are posting full episodes, talking books, and bonus video content. You can follow us on Twitter at Talking Feds Pod, and you can look to see our latest offerings on Patreon, where we post bonus discussions with national experts about special topics exclusively for supporters, such as our discussion this week of an important Washington Post article asking, are we headed for civil war? Submit your questions to talkingfeds.com contact. Whether it's for Talking Five or general questions about the inner workings of the legal system for our sidebar segments. Thanks for tuning in. And don't worry, as long as you need answers, the Feds will keep talking. Talking Feds is produced by Olivia Henriksen. Sound engineering by Matt McArdle. Rosie Don Griffin and David Lieberman are our contributing writers. Production assistance by Laura Feldner. Kalena Tano, Emma Maynard, and David Emmett. Thanks very much to George Newburn for his sidebar explaining hearsay. Our gratitude, as always, to the amazing Philip Glass, who graciously lets us use his music. Talking Feds is a production of Delito LLC. I'm Harry Littman. Talk to you later.